Hey there, listeners. This is Justin with a quick note before today's episode. Spotify recently allowed users to start leaving reviews for podcasts, and I would greatly appreciate it if you would consider listening to the show on Spotify, leaving us a positive review. I don't even think you have to write anything in. You just give a star rating and that's it. But uh, if you're willing to do that, I would greatly appreciate it. Thanks and enjoy today's show. Welcome back to Beyond the Uniform. I'm Justin Asiri, and my goal is to help members of the military community thrive in their post-service career and life. Today's episode number 424, Growing a Business Through Acquisitions with Mike Maynard. That's certainly true. That What happens is when you buy a business in, when you acquire somebody, you're accelerating everything. Mm. Um, And so you're accelerating your presence into a particular market over and above, you know, trying to win clients and case studies and things like that, as you say. But I think it's really important as well to remember that you're accelerating how quickly you feel the pain. With both the acquisition, actually, particularly with the second one, I've had more sleepless nights than I've had for anything else I've done in business. A while back, I sent out a survey to all of you. I really appreciate those of you who responded. Uh, One of the questions I asked was about bringing in non-veterans who might have expertise to share with our audience. And the response was overwhelmingly positive. So today is the first episode I'm doing like that. I learned so much from my conversation with Mike. I'm glad I set up this interview. Uh, He bought, even though he had a background in electrical engineering, semiconductors, he bought, of all things, a PR agency. And uh, back in 2001, has continued to grow that. But one of the tools he used for growth has been acquiring other agencies. So in this, we talk about his own career transition of going from someone on the tech side to someone on the marketing side as an owner and operator, but also the process of acquiring other businesses, what that, what that has looked like. For those of you who have listened to other episodes about search funds or entrepreneurship through acquisitions, there's a lot in common with this. So with that, let's dive into my conversation with Mike. <laughs> Joining me today, my guest is Mike Maynard. I'm going to mispronounce this, Mike. Chichicha, England, which is in the south of England. Correct me on that one. Is that is that off? Oh, that's, that's pretty good, Justin. It's Chichester. Chichester. So a very English town name, yeah. <laughs> for context for listeners, normally on the show, I have on military veterans to talk about what they're doing post-service. Um, I connected with Mike a couple of weeks ago. Very unique story, a career transition story that I haven't heard before and thought would benefit from our audience. So was excited to invite him on to the show. Let me give you the quick rundown on his background. He is the managing director of the Napier Group, a 7 million PR and marketing agency for B2B technology companies. He was awarded a master's degree in electronic and electrical engineering from the University of Surrey and an MBA from Kingston University and acquired Napier in 2001. Since that time, Mike has directed major PR and marketing programs for a wide range of global technology clients, reaching over 30 European countries. He is actively involved in developing the PR and marketing industries and is chair of the PRCA B2B group and is a visiting lecturer in PR at Southampton Solent University. Mike, to start things off, we'll talk about the acquisition of Napier in 2001, but what would you want people to know about what were you doing prior to that? Because it wasn't exactly owning and running a PR agency. Oh, no, no. So when I went to university, I studied electronics engineering. And actually, I started my career as an electronics design engineer. So I designed radar systems. I designed mixing desks, recording studios. I designed printing machines. So a variety of different jobs. And probably the fact I I jumped between jobs shows that I wasn't really enjoying being a design engineer. And so I moved from design engineering into technical support. And so again, helping engineers use products, designing products. So it was it was part technical support, part te- technical sales. And it's a pretty well-identified role within the electronics industry. It's kind of different. It, it's not quite the same you'd see outside of a technology industry. But that's what I was doing. So, so very, very different. And then I got opportunity to move into marketing and jump to that opportunity without, I think, really thinking about, you know, some of the challenges I might face. 
it's so crazy because it's such a big shift. And I'm just kind of curious, what gave you the courage to, when I think of electrical engineering, which was my undergrad as well, when I think of semiconductor industry, it feels like so much the opposite of what I think of with marketing, advertising, PR, which to me feels like much more creative, much less structured. What gave you the courage to make such a monumental shift? I think mainly ignorance and enthusiasm were probably the two main things. And to me, it is actually quite important not to overthink these decisions. If we do think about these kind of big career changes, it's so easy to think of reasons why it won't work. And believe me, there were times where it was really close to not working. So making those big career jumps, I think you've kind of just got to trust if that's what you want to do. You've got to give it a go. You know, and I know a lot of your listeners are, you know, people in the military or people who've left the military. That's a huge career jump. And I think if you really thought it through, it would be hard to see that there'd be many careers that are open to you. But actually, there's a huge range of opportunity open. And I think people have just got to be brave and go with what interests them and what they think they'll enjoy. I hate to admit it, my mind immediately goes to long ago when I was single, getting the courage to ask a girl out or go up to a girl at a bar or whatever it is. And I'm like, yeah, if you thought about it too much, I probably wouldn't have done that. And it's probably (laughs) true of of many big decisions. So bring us back, you know, I'm thinking 2001, I believe is when you bought Napier. I'm just thinking at the time, even though I was in the military, I know that something big was happening in 2001. Talk us through what happened there. Yeah, so um, it actually brings me to something that they never teach you in business school, but it's really important, which is timing. You've got to get your timing right. So I bought an agency that was totally focused on technology and mainly focused on communications-related technology just at the time that dot-com crash hit the newspapers. It was literally about three weeks after I bought the agency. The whole technology world seemed to go into meltdown. Like I say, you could think through problems. You could see that there was potential for you know, the market to boom, but also the market to crash. I mean, the, the technology industry has always been a little bit cyclical. It's gone up, gone down. So, um, you know, you could have easily you know, maybe for seeing this happen, but finding that timing is so hard. You know, knowing when it would happen is almost impossible. And clearly, you know, in my case, I got it completely wrong. When you took the helm and then this crisis occurred, what was that first year like? Like, did you have to significantly reduce the workforce? Were you regretting that decision? Did you just kind of expect this was part of it? How did that first year go? It was really tough. There was just like this, I've made the jump, I've got to do it. You've just got to push through. I mean, I think there was um, there was definitely regrets, but I don't think there was any opportunity to turn around. You know? So obviously, when you make career changes, there's different levels of investment. And so people invest in training and there's a lot of time in there. I mean, clearly, when you buy an agency, you're investing money. And so it's very hard to walk away from how much you've invested and, and how much debt you've got You just have to push through. And I think, you know, a lot of it was just really kept going, kept hoping that things would get better. And of course, eventually they do. I mean, things don't stay terrible for forever. They do turn around. One thing I'm thinking about as well. So on the show before I've had on people who did a search fund, which is entrepreneurship through acquisition, which is similar, mm-hmm. similar, but not exactly the same of what you're talking about. I'm curious when you decided to, to purchase this agency, How much of it was, I need to now learn about PR, copywriting, marketing, things like that, versus how much of it was, my job is I'm a business owner, so I'm going to support people who have functional knowledge that I don't, and I don't necessarily need to learn that skill set. Yeah, that's a a great question. I think if I look back, I completely underestimated the jump. Having worked effectively on in and client side, so companies that employ agencies. I've always worked on that side. I kind of looked at it and went, how big can that difference be actually going to agencies? And the answer is it's huge. And I completely underestimated that. So, you know, you can look at it and say, actually, what I should have done was I just run the company, let people be the experts. But you had to learn that business. You had to understand the business to be able to run a business effectively. So so you had to have those functional skills. You don't have to be an expert in, every, in everything. And I think that that's always really important when you're running a business is you don't have to, to know everything, but you absolutely had to have you know a certain understanding of what people were doing and what challenges they faced in their roles to be able to run the business. That was a huge learning curve for me. I want to ask you a couple of questions because I know that you've acquired multiple businesses, but let me just give you room. I'd love, I gave a brief intro, set the stage for us. Like how would you describe the company today? What are you guys doing? Where are you at in your journey? 
At the moment, the uh, company is about 35 people. So we've grown from, I think we were seven or eight when, when I acquired the agency. So um, good growth there in terms of turnover we've grown. And it's been a mix of things. It's been both growing our existing clients, going out, winning new business, and also some acquisition as well. So we're in a much more stable place than I think we've ever been as an agency. At one point, we were doing really well, but one of our clients was responsible for over three quarters of our turnover. You look at that and, uh, you know, one of the things people say in the agency world is, you know, you're always two phone calls away from going out of business. Well, I was one phone call from, away from going out of business at that point. And we had to make sure we looked after that client. And that taught us a lot about really, you know, giving everything to make sure that you keep a client happy. So it certainly wasn't a bad experience, but it was very stressful. Now, I think as we've grown the agency, you do get some more security. You know, we've got multiple large clients that, you know, if one of them went, yeah, it would be really painful, but it wouldn't be the end of the agency. Described for people not familiar with an agency, like describe the type of things that you're doing. I know that you're focused on, or I believe you're focused on tech still. What sort of work do you do for them? What we try and do is we try and get people who are engineers to go and pick our clients' products or our clients' services. And that is it. And that's really interesting because you kind of alluded it to it, to this earlier that engineers don't always like marketing. They don't like being marketed to. So a lot of what we're doing is we're trying to market to our engineers by helping them do their job, not by hammering down you know, marketing messages and adverts so they just keep seeing them and, and keep hating them because engineers tend to be quite negative about that. And not through, you know, the more consumer-related gimmicky kind of advertising. It tends to be very different. And that's why we're so specialized in this niche, is we understand actually what gets engineers excited. Sometimes that is a really nice 3D animation in video. Sometimes it's a 50-page white paper in PDF. And sometimes it's specifications for a product in an ad. It can be all sorts of different things, but it's about how you present it. So that's really what we do. That's our, our level of expertise is being able to take information about a product and present it to engineers in a way that's most likely to make them think positively about it. That's great. You know, when you say that, it makes me realize the role of empathy in, in understanding both your clients and their needs, but but ultimately the people they're trying to get in front of what they're looking for. And, and through that lens, I can see why your unique background is so valuable here. Like have, being an engineer, having worked in those organizations, you obviously understand the end customer and you have a lot of empathy and understanding there. And that makes you pretty uh, pretty potent in your role. What, what would you, for those curious about, you know, a lot of our audience aspires to be an entrepreneur or to be a business owner, what is your day-to-day look like? I'm guessing there's a lot of maybe sales work of, of bringing in new clients and overseeing. Like, how, what, what sort of work do you do on a week-to-week basis? Nominally, I have a goal of spending about half my time on the business. And that can be you know, anything from recruiting through to management, through to people management, training, things like that. And then a quarter of my time working on client projects and a quarter of my time working on growing the business, so new business. And that's kind of my goal. When I get to the first month where I actually achieve it and do it perfectly, I'll let you know. We're a long yeah. way away from that. But obviously, you know, sometimes you have more business, new business opportunities, you're doing more selling. Other times you have a crisis with a client, you spend more time with the client, or you have more work than, than people can cope with. You have to come in and provide more um, support. But the interesting thing is, is running a business, it, whether it's been a eight people or 30 people, you still really need to get a, a view of everything in the business. You don't have to do it. And the more people we've got, the more there's areas of the business that I don't physically do, I'd, I probably couldn't do now. But you've got to really have a handle of what's going on, you know, even when you're up to 30, 40 people. I think everyone, when they start a business, they start with, you know, a few, a few people, maybe it's just yourself, maybe it's you and a business partner. And, and you kind of think, well, we're going to get to 10 people and then there'll be this and there'll be this and, and it'll all run magically. It, it doesn't. There's always problems. And there's always issues bringing you back. I mean, the great thing is we've grown, we've we've been able to build a management team. And to me, that's probably the most important thing that anyone trying to build an entrepreneurial business has to think about is not just what they're doing, but how they can build a team around them as the leader. Because those people will then be the experts in their particular areas of the business. I was just writing that down. That's such a great point, man, of just understanding your strengths, weaknesses, and then 
building that team around you. I wanted to make sure I asked about the acquisitions because I understand you've done a couple of these. And in the back of my mind, just for our audience, I'm thinking, well, maybe part of the goal of the acquisition was to get a book of business to obtain clients. Another might be the employees and the skill sets of bringing them on. Another one might be maybe there was a, an agency that had a really good presence or, or you know, brand. I'm curious, like, what have those acquisitions looked like? Any advice for growing a company through acquiring other established companies? Well, well, the first thing is all those those reasons for acquisition all applied to us. I mean, they were great points. So, I mean, predominantly what we were trying to do with the acquisitions was get good people and also get a presence in new markets. Mm. The reason for that, I mean, firstly, if you want to try and sell into a market as an agency, people always ask what your experience is. And if you go and say, you know, I'd like to help you sell these industrial automation systems, and they say, well, what have you done in industrial automation? You say, well, done silicon chips. Nobody's interested. So getting a presence in a market is really important with acquisitions for an agency, particularly. But then you've got the problem that typically all your clients are on at most an annual contract. So if they've just signed it, you've got a year. But in reality, you have to understand that as an agency, a client, if they're really upset, could probably walk and there's very little you can do about it. We have had, you know, clients change their mind and we have held them to contracts. But if there's any kind of element of, you know, us being partly responsible, it's very hard to hold them to a contract. Mm -hmm. Um, And working with an unhappy client is just a terrible thing to do as an agency. Nobody enjoys it. Nobody wants to work on that client. The client's not happy. The results aren't great. So you're very, very vulnerable when you buy an agency because actually, irrespective of what you've got in terms of contractual commitment, pretty much all that business could walk tomorrow. And so to me, it's not just about buying the business, the presence in the markets, but you've got to be buying the agency for the people as well. And you've got to be buying a team that is going to basically grow and develop and expand the agency. So if we look at the two we did, the first was a very small one, about three people in the agency. So really simple. A lot of that was to teach us how to do acquisitions. And we learned we weren't very good at it. So, um, you know, it took us a couple of years after that to, to get back into the game, but we learned an awful lot from it. We learned a lot about integrating people, about how we can keep the team we acquire happy, about how we can keep the clients happy. So we learned an awful lot there. And the next one was significantly bigger, but there it was very much about what that agency could bring to us. And in particular, we talk, and, and this is getting a bit geeky, you know, marketing speak, but fundamentally in marketing, I look at it as being very simple. Some people say, well, you've got, you know, you've got digital and you've got online and you're doing this, and you've got PR and you've got, I look at it as basically you, you generate stuff, you get it in front of the audience, the people you want to see it. So we talk about content generation and content distribution. And actually Napier was really, really good at the content distribution side, but we weren't so good at the content generation side. So we recognized a weakness and we actually bought an agency to address that. And that really impacted what we do. So now we're much, much better at generating the content and we get much more work for it as well, both from clients that we've we've acquired, but also the clients we had already. It's definitely improved the agency. And to me, that's got to be the reason for buying another agency or buying another company is to improve your own business. I think that comes through so strongly and I hope it comes through for, for our listeners is the brilliance of growing through acquisition. And I'm not trying to imply that it's easy because I imagine integrating team members, like there's so much complexity there. But when you describe like, it's right, like, oh yeah, you want to do this for us. Who have you worked with? Well, if you buy a business that's done that sort of work, instantly you're more credible. And when I think of the alternative of building case studies, building new business, building expertise, growing a team, hiring, like that is not easy either. And so, and I like your perspective that you, it sounds like you bought that first three person company. And obviously it's the first time you did it. There's so many mistakes, but then that allows you to be better on the next one that you bought. So that's, I'm just very impressed at the elegance of how you've grown your company through acquisitions rather than just the brute force of making mistakes on your own. And I think, you know, that's certainly true that what happens is when you buy a business in, when you acquire somebody, you're accelerating everything. And so you're accelerating your presence into a particular market over and above, you know, trying to win clients and case studies and things like that, as you say. But I think it's really important as well to remember that you're accelerating 
how quickly you feel the pain. With both the acquisition, actually, particularly with the second one, I've had more sleepless nights than I've had for anything else I've done in business. And it's because all the stresses are so compressed. Everything is in such a tight timeline. You can grow very quickly. You can build the agency quickly. You can get better. But you also have a lot more problems to deal with in a lot shorter time frame. So, I mean, to me, that that's the downside of acquisition. You as a, a business owner have got to realize that it's not going to go perfectly. None of these acquisitions go. But there's always problems, you know. And, and Hopefully, acquisition, you know, 90% is good, 10% is bad, but that 10% gets compressed into a very short amount of time. So it is a very stressful process. Awesome. Well, Mike, I appreciate your sharing your time and perspective with us today. Just to leave listeners with something, where would you like them to go if they'd like to learn more about what you're up to? Um, well, two places they can go. They can go to the website. Our website is napierb2b.com. But equally, um, if people just want to know what I'm doing, connect with me on LinkedIn, search for Mike Maynard. I'm the only Mike Maynard working at a company called Napier. Love to connect with people if I can help anybody, anything like that would be great. And, and if somebody's got a question, I mean, just email me. It's probably a fair guess. I think most people would work it out that my email is mike at napierb2b.com. You know, if you've got a question, just email me. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Justin. I really enjoyed the conversation. Surface, surface, surface. Beyond the Uniform is written and produced by me, Justin Asiri, with the help from our chief of staff, Steve Bain, our editor, Lex Brown, and our head of social media, Janelle Hanf. We are an all-volunteer organization and would greatly appreciate your help in any of the following ways. First of all, spread the word. Beyond the Uniform has over 380 podcast episodes and 15 on-demand webinars, all offered for free. Help us spread the word on social media, at military bases, or whatever gets this resource in front of the men and women who need it. Positive reviews on iTunes go a long way towards this as well. Second of all, sponsorship. Beyond the Uniform relies on sponsorship to keep us going. There is so much more we'd like to do, but just don't have nearly the resources to do it. If you know of a company that would advertise in any way with Beyond the Uniform, please send them our way. Third of all, donations. If you're in a financial position to donate, you can find more information on the support section of our website. At our website, beyondtheuniform.org, you'll find over 380 episodes categorized by industry, functional role, and more. You'll also find both free and for purchase resources that take a deeper dive on topics related to career growth. Thank you for your support as we aim to help members of the military and their families thrive in their post-military career and life.